Thanks, Simon. I think that's quite telling about our audience as well. You do realize that you call them serious nerds as well. Because, yes, I am here tonight to talk to you not just about ETFs and certainly not just about um, some costs, but I'm trying to really sort of try and give you a comprehensive overview of the costs that are incurred in the investment value chain. Some of those are unavoidable. Others are negotiable, and then there are others still that you really don't need to be paying. But I want to at least raise awareness of those so that you know what you're in for and that you understand why I'm not in the same camp as Simon when I say, let's go for that zero level. That's a dangerous place to be, and I'll tell you why. But, you know, like any good uh, presentation at a very well-regulated institution such as the JSE, I do have to start with a health warning trying to get my clicker to talk to me. There we go. Our health warning. Yes, we are talking costs. We are talking fees. We are talking things that make the clicker go click. There we go. <laughs> and why it is so important is that as we can bring fees down, the ultimate is that our investment returns go up. But yes, I'm afraid, Christia, this one especially for you, this is a serious nerd alert. So I'm going to be throwing lots of numbers at you. I'm going to be throwing graphs, calculations, all of those to you. So please, if you do fall asleep, I will only wake you up if you snore. Other than that, go right ahead. We'll pick you up at 6.30 when we're done with all of this. Right, let's get straight into our conversation around the components of investment costs. And yes, my little um, graph at the top has got five components because I'm going to be talking about five different components of investment costs with you. Looks like this clicker. Thank you very much, Simon. <laughs> Let's see if this one works better. Yes, the product cost. The first thing is actually putting together an investment product of some sort. What goes into the manufacturing of such a product and what are those types of costs? Then we've got to go and buy those boxes that we created, go to the, to the shopping center, go put them in our, in our trolley and pay for what it is that we're buying. A second level or layer of investment costs. But, you know, certainly when we get these, bring them home, we need to store them somewhere. There we go our admin fee or our platform fee, and not only store them somewhere, but also have some sort of record of what do we actually have, um, record keeping in terms of who owns what and who has what. And maybe when you go to the shop, you're not quite sure which of these things should you be buying. So maybe there's a component of advice fee in terms of this, that you would like to actually be told what to do or how to grow your money faster. And unfortunately, that's not all just yet because who knows, there's always something else. So we'll look at some what else right at the end for our five components of investment costs. I think I'm going to stand more to this side because it seems to me that that's a better way for you to see the full screen. Right, so let's get straight into it in terms of our production costs. So what is involved in actually creating an investment product of some sort? And I'm going to use as an example, I think one of the most common things with that we're mostly familiar with, and that is a unit trust or a CIS. So when we talk about producing an investment product, there's two components to it. The one is the initial cost to create it. Is that what I'm talking about? Um, so just to get them out on the street, on the shelf, is that the, the one? And, you know, quite frankly, most of you might say, listen, not my monkey, not my circus. This is the product provider's problem. They can pay for that as far as I'm concerned. I just want the product once it's already there on the shelf. So, you know, just give me that part of it. And I'm going to ask you to hold that thought because it's quite interesting to see that in some cases, yes, it is the product provider's problem. But in other cases, you as the investor, and sometimes inadvertently you as the investor, actually pays for that initial cost. I think more important for me at this stage is that I want to look at those ongoing, um, the cost to maintain an investment product. And it introduces the first of many TLAs that we're going to be talking about tonight. TLAs, three-letter acronyms. This one is a TER, the total expense ratio, something that over the years I think we've become a lot more familiar with in investment circles. Most of us might understand what it is. We certainly know it's an important number to look at. But what is a TER and why is that not good enough in terms of cost disclosure? Not good enough to the extent that we now have TC. By the way, that's also a, um, a TLA. It's a two-letter acronym, right? Transaction costs get added to it, and that gives us our TIC, the total investment charge. And increasingly, you will now find on fact sheets, minimum disclosure documents of investment funds, that they will disclose a TIC for you, the total investment charge. 
but what sits in each of those components and, and what what of those are important? What of those do, do we not really have much of a choice? We just have to absorb those costs at, as part of our investment value chain. So let's get straight into an example of a total expense ratio. Really not having much joy with this clicker. There we go. Right. So what's in a total expense ratio? First of all, there are some fixed costs associated with managing and running a, an investment fund, such as a collective investment scheme. The fixed costs typically are things like your trustee fees, audit fees, regulatory charges, licensing fees, these sort of things. And clearly, because it is a fixed cost, what you will find is the smaller the fund, the bigger that fixed cost component will be as a percentage of the total size of the fund. And I'll show you some numbers in a bit just to explain what I say there. But then there's a whole host of variable costs, and although there might not be that many, they certainly are usually a lot more significant in terms of the overall cost. The first one is the Manco fee, Manco Management Company. It's a term that is used in industry really to denote the product issuer, the product provider. And typically the Manco fee is relatively small. When you see some of the numbers, you might not agree with me that it's relatively small, but this is really the fee for the management company, the product provider really, to run its business, to be regulatory compliant, to have all its licenses and systems and processes in place. The big one really that I think most of us have become a lot more aware of is the asset management fee. And it is because it is so variable, it varies significantly according to the type of investment style that is being off, um, offered, most importantly between actively managed funds and then index tracking funds. So the management fee is something that is more and more being disclosed also as a separate fee. And people then often make the mistake to think that there's a management fee and a total expense ratio. All that they're doing is they are disclosing to you the management fee, the asset management fee that is already incorporated in the total expense ratio. So it's all about transparency, all about um, clearing um, and, and clearer picture of fees and not something that sits on top of the total expense ratio. My biggest bugbear of all of them, and if I never have to see one again in my life, it'll be too soon, a performance fee. And performance fees can actually be significant. I'm going to talk about it later on also and explain to you why I believe that this is the biggest, no, not the biggest, but one of the biggest um, bugbears for me in our industry. And it's particularly a bugbear if that hurdle is inappropriate. What do I mean with a hurdle rate? A performance fee is paid when the performance of the fund exceeds some sort of hurdle or target rate. Right. And quite often we find that those hurdle rates are wholly inappropriate and that you are having to pay extra fees on a fund for something that really does not represent any form of skill that the fund manager exhibited. But more about that later. <clears throat> When it comes to index tracking funds, there's an index licensing fee. Yes, it's small, but still, it is there and it needs to be, we need to be aware of it so that we know what those total cost structures are all about. So, let's look at an example of a CIS. There's another one of our TLAs, a collective investment scheme. Really just a modern word for the better known maybe unit trust, or as it's known in international markets, a mutual fund. So let's look at those basic components of the fixed costs and the variable costs. And this is really just an illustration. Those are not actual numbers, but just to give you an idea of the sort of numbers that we might be talking about, the annual trustee fee for a CIS might be 300,000 Rand, the audit fee 200,000 Rand, and then our variable costs, the Manco fee, 25 basis points, asset manager fee, well, it could be anything from as little as 10 basis points to at least 150 basis points. So that's where the big variation comes in. Now, you can appreciate that when we look at these sort of numbers and we start looking at the size of the fund, it now suddenly becomes a lot more relevant how big the fund is. So in my first example here, I've got a 50 million rand fund. So my 500,000 rand of fixed costs represents 1% cost. That's just the fixed cost. If I now add my variable costs in there, which together can be anything between 35 and 175 basis points, you can see why it's quite easy, even for a relatively inexpensively managed fund, to have quite a high total expense ratio, mostly because the fund is so small. So it's a relatively small amount of money that's got to carry quite a heavy load in terms of these fixed costs. So what if my fund is slightly bigger? Let's say I now have a 500 million fund. Well, now my fixed costs drop quite sharply. It comes down to just 
0.1%. And now suddenly my, my total expense ratio starts becoming a lot more palatable. And I think that's also one of the reasons why the FISCA or the FSB um, as its forerunner try to encourage funds to have a certain minimum size. Back in the days, I remember that was a 30 million target. I think 30 million is way too small. I really find it very difficult to see how a fund can be viable unless it's at least 100 million rand. And we've got many many unit trusts in South Africa that are below that level. So be aware of the fact that if you're investing into a fund that's relatively small, it will have a disproportionately large total expense ratio purely just because of the size of the fund. And there's not much that you can do about that. If it's a nice big 5 billion rand fund, well, now our, that fixed cost drops right down. And now we can see why we are now starting to deal with some total expenses that are a lot more palatable and something that we've become a lot more used to. Not just in the actively managed fund world, there you see a fairly typical sort of 1.76% at the upper end of the scale and maybe as low as 36 basis points or even less on the index tracking scale. So this is an example for a collective investment scheme just in general. But now we have different forms of collective investment schemes as well. So let's compare them on that basis and say, right, if I was now going to compare my actively managed CIS, there's my cost structure as I had it. Not quite sure what my management fee will be, but I know it's certainly going to be a lot more than 10 basis points, around about 25 for the Manco fee. There's my basic pricing structure for my actively managed CIS. So what if I was now having um, looking at the cost structure of an index tracking CIS? So it's still a unit trust, but now I'm actually tracking an index. So the two big differences that you see is now there's an additional cost. There's an index calculation fee, a fixed cost that needs to be paid by the fund. And also we have an index tracking license fee. So do you see that the cost structure of the index tracking CIS is actually higher than that of the index tracking unit trust. Sorry, not the index tracking unit, the actively managed unit trust. But of course, we are going to come to that difference in the asset management fee just now. But interestingly enough, if I now look at an index tracking ETF, you see that it has an even further cost that gets loaded onto it. And that's the listing fee because it is exchange traded. So when you look at it from this perspective, quite frankly, we would expect that the index tracking ETF should be the most expensive of these three options. But of course it's not. So why is it not? Let's dig into why the index tracking ETF is always the cheapest version of what we're looking at here. So let's look at some of our sort of best known and uh, sort of broadest based ETFs that we've got in the market. We've got four different ETFs that track the top 40 index. Satrix 40, 10 basis points, 0.1% total expense ratio. Ashburton at 15, Signia Itrix at 16, and Stanlip at 29 basis points. They give you exactly the same underlying investment exposure. And yet one is almost three times as expensive from a total expense ratio perspective as the cheapest one. So now you can start comparing apples with apples because you're getting the same underlying investment exposure. But clearly the total expense ratio is now a good indicator for you of relative cost structures between these different products. And on average, when we look at, sorry, before we go on to, to the rest of the ones, I just want to talk quickly about a targeted TER, because as I showed you there, those are some of the costs that are there. But you know, for example, when Signia launched the top 40 ETF about a year ago, and when Satrix decided that they were going to lower their cost structure to 10 basis points, they announced it in advance of actually doing it. Now, a TER needs to be calculated on the basis of actual expenses for the last 12 months. So how are they able to do that if the fund has not yet been in existence for that long? And this is how a targeted TER works. Effectively, when an ETF is launched, to try and give the market some indication of what cost structure they can expect around this fund, they are typically launched with an intended or target TER number. What then happens is the ETF issuer, on a daily basis, accrues one 365th of that targeted TER in its cost. So the pricing of the ETF contains those costs already, and every single day we just accrue one 365th of that targeted TER. 
So what happens is after one year, well, now the actual TR will equal the target TR because that's what you've been accruing all along. And that's how they are able to launch a fund with a target TR, even though it hasn't even traded for a single day. But now what does that mean in terms of the actual costs incurred in the fund? Does that mean that they incurred those actual costs? Well, the ETF issuer will receive those accrued amount of expenses. So that 1 365th of the, of the target TR, they will receive that as an actual cash flow, as a covering of the expenses. But the ETF issuer also will pay the total actual costs that have been incurred in the fund. And clearly you can appreciate that there could often be times that the ETF issuer in this way subsidizes the shortfall. Especially when you start with a small fund, remember I showed you that when a fund is relatively small at the outset, it's very likely that the actual costs as a percentage will be quite a bit bigger than this target TR that you want to. So it actually provides investors with a wonderful opportunity to participate at a fund at a level where the known costs are disclosed up front and the ETF issuer ensures that that is the actual cost that is due to the investor. So that's one of the reasons, I guess, why when we start comparing TRs across different products in South Africa, we see that the average of, I've shown you those top 40 ETFs, when we look at the average of all the local ETFs listed on the JSE, it's currently just over 0.3%, so 31 basis points, 0.31%. Interestingly enough, when we look at the average of all the local index tracking unit trusts in South Africa, we find that that total expense ratio is almost double those of the ETFs. And then, of course, not a surprise for you that the average of all the South African general equity funds in South Africa sits at a cost that it is more than five times the total expense ratio of a um, locally listed ETF. Why such big cost differentials? Let's see if we can try and dig a little bit more into it. Because unfortunately, the bad news is that the TR is not even all the costs. Remember I said there was the other TLAs, the TC and the TIC? Well, let's have a look at it. Because you see, we know that the asset management fee is one of the main reasons why the actively managed fund comes in at a much higher price. But the other thing is the trading costs. And we are now talking about the costs inside the fund, the costs that are incurred to actually manage the fund, to get the underlying assets into this fund. And here we know that the actively managed fund could have ultra high, I say ultra high trading costs. We have some unit trusts that turn over the book 400 times, so four, sorry, 400 percent, so four times the size of the book. So if they are, if it's a 100 million rand fund, it would trade 400 million rand in a single year. So we've got some funds with massively high trading costs. And until we introduced this concept of the TC and the TIC, most of us were not even aware of those costs being incurred. We're going to get back there. <laughs> there we go. Right. So. What we find is that the level of activity in a fund is really what determines the amount of trading costs. So we've got some index tracking funds that are quite active, the smart beta funds. And then we've got some actively managed unit trusts that actually don't trade all that much. So don't assume just because something is an index tracking fund or an ETF that it's got low trading costs or assume that because something is actively managed that it's got high trading costs. That's why that disclosure is now so useful and so important for us to look at that. Because you see, at the end of the day, there is actually no such thing as passive investments. Yes, I'll repeat it again. There is no such thing as a passive investment. All investing is active but it's the level of activity that varies across a spectrum. So when we talk about passive, really the only passive that would be there is a pure buy and hold strategy. If your great grandfather bought you shares in, I don't know, SAB Miller in 18, what was it? And put those share certificates in the bottom drawer and you only received those dividend checks and you never actually did anything with those until of course you were forced to sell it and pay a hell of a lot of capital gains tax on it. But that's besides the point. That would be pure passive investment. 
What is often referred to as passive investment is really just sort of a low churn or a low turnover active. So that would be your traditional passive, your market cap weighted indices like the S&P 500, the FTSE 100, the top 40. They've got relatively low turnover because most of the time the constituents stay pretty much the same. There might be one or two that change. There might be small changes in terms of the shares in issue or the weights in the indices. But by and large, they stay pretty passive in terms of their makeup. But then on the other end of the spectrum, we've got either a top-down sort of active rules-based approach or a bottom-up, your proper traditional active skill, value investing, stock picking, selecting those. And now, of course, we've got this innovation creep that is happening through indices where more and more index tracker funds use a lot of these rules bases to give us things like the Divi Plus, like a low volatility, like a RAFI form of index. But the point is they're still a lot more active than your traditional low churn active funds. So we've got this continuum really that we can look at in terms of both the level of activity as well as the trading cost that is then associated with it. So uh, the lowest activity level is on this end, the highest activity level, and they're not surprised to see that obviously the cost spectrum with it as well would also be the lowest cost transaction cost on this side and the highest on that side. We're trying, there we go. So that's really sort of a continuum or a spectrum on which we find investments. And that's why it's quite important to not just assume that because something is called an actively managed fund or an index tracking fund, that it will have a certain level of trading costs associated with it. So let's look at this activity cost gradient. We know that passive costs less than active. But at the same time, we now also know that there is no such thing as passive. So buy and hold passive doesn't exist. So so-called passive costs less than active. And then we've got now this rules-based active, which costs less than traditional active. And there's our smart beta. So appreciate that depending on where you sit on this gradient, your costs of the underlying fund will be varying. Varying by how much and how important is that? Now, let's get a sense of the size of some of those costs and how they go into it. Because, sorry, I just want to make sure that I didn't skip a slide. doesn't look like it. So, our total investment costs, unfortunately, still does not tell the full story of costs. We're going deeper and deeper into this. Because one of the most definitive things in terms of product costs actually relates to cash flows. Cash flows that would be either new investments that come into the fund that require the creation of units. Remember on my first slide, I said to you, hold that thought that you say, this is not my monkey, this is not my circus, the product provider can pay for the creation of the products. I've got bad news for you. Unfortunately, in some forms of investment funds, you don't have a choice. You are paying for it. Similarly, you are also paying when there are withdrawals from the fund, which requires the redemption of units. So why would that be the case? Well, it is because our unit trust industry operates in what is called primary market operations, things that are created or redeemed at the outset. Whereas our ETF market, our exchange traded funds operate in the secondary market, where all we're doing is we are exchanging existing units in the ETF. And those two have got a very different cost model. Let's look at that cost of actually creation and redemption. Because how big is that impact of cash flows? What do you think does it cost to invest 100 million rand into the shares that make up the all share index if your brokerage rate is five basis points? Who would like to take a guess? What does it cost you to invest that? Five basis points? Does it cost you more? Does it cost you less because it's a lot of money that you're investing? We tend to only focus on that brokerage rate and we think, oh, but that's surely that's the only cost around trading and transaction, but not even remotely. Let me show you how the cost structure works. So there's my 100 million rand that I want to invest. My brokerage rate of five basis points, but I add that and there's my total brokerage bill. 
But then the JSE charges fees and levies straight fees and so on. And there's a whole formula in terms of how that is put together. But effectively, you pay for every single transaction that you do. So if there are 165 shares in the all share index, you're going to be incurring certain costs 165 times. If you're trading a top 40 index, you're going to be incurring those costs 40 times. So the number of shares that you're trading influence those JSE fees and levies. But this is the one that most people either don't know about or choose to ignore. STT, Securities Transfer Tax. It's 0.25% and it's like VAT. It's not negotiable. You can't get away from it. It's a have to pay. And on every single buy transaction that you do, you've got to pay that 25 basis points. It's five times the cost of the brokerage in terms of this. So my total cost actually is now 31.1 basis points, way more than the five basis points that I thought it cost me. And in fact, in this graph, you can see this big red chunk is my STT chunk. There's a the little bit of JC fees and levies, and there's my brokerage, that gray bar that sits on top of it. So that 31 is much more representative of the cost of actually putting 100 million rand of investment into a fund that follows the all share index. But now what if I don't receive that 100 million rand in one go? What if I get, so here's my same 100 million lump sum, 31.1 basis points. What if I get that as four flows of 25 million rand each? It's still 100 million rand that I'm investing. So my STT is exactly the same and my brokerage is exactly the same because they were just a percentage of the investment value. But what's changed? My statutory charges. Because now I'm trading four times as much in terms of the number of transactions that I did in this case. And now you can see my costs are starting to creep up. Now I'm sitting at 33.6 basis points. And what if I don't receive 25 million in one go? What if I receive that as five flows of 5 million rand each? Not uncommon in the unit trust industry. Suddenly my cost just to invest the underlying funds is a percent. And so who do you think pays for this? This is the bad news <laughs> if you're a unit trust investor. If you're a unit trust investor, you're paying for it. In fact, not the person who's coming into the fund, the people that are already in the fund are the ones that are paying because these fees are considered capital events. Ask a CISA why they deemed this to be a capital event, but they say from a financial statement perspective, this is not a balance sheet item, income and expenses. This is a, oh, sorry, not an income statement, it's a balance sheet item, it's a capital event. So this cost, this 100 basis points that I showed you there, is not included in either your TER or your TIC. It's included in the NAV, another TLA, the net asset value. And how do you see how much your NAV are impacted by? Well, you don't. You only after time realize that well, performance is not looking so lacquer. And it's because it's being constantly eroded by the cost of both creation and redemption. So all the existing or the remaining investors in the fund are paying for these activities. So if you're a fairly passive investor in an actively managed unit trust, even if you never ever invest more money or take money out of it. You are carrying costs on behalf of other people. Now, obviously, the larger the fund and the, the smaller the amount that comes in and out as a proportion of the overall fund, the less this impact is. But the point is, it's still an impact. It's still a cost that is there all the time. So you might say, but so what about the ETF? You know, doesn't the same apply to the ETF? And actually, no, it doesn't. Because you see, the ETF, whoops, that was too much too soon. Let me be going to get to the right spot. <laughs> no, it doesn't want to. You see, I think somebody is against ETFs here that just does not want to show me this. Let me not do anything. Simon, you do. <laughs> you press the buttons. No, it doesn't want to. 
Oh, so does it come on the next slide? Thank you, Simon. He knows better what goes on in my own slides, apparently. So here's our example again of, you know, the different costs and the cost flows. And this big cost argument is something that is not, as I say, included in either the TER or the TIC, but it does negatively affect the NAV price. So what I wanted to show you in terms of the ETF, there we go, another TLA. This is done, this creation or redemption process is something that is done by the market maker on behalf of the issuer. It's costs that are incurred outside of the fund. So they first create these units and then they just deliver them into the ETF fund. And those costs are actually paid by the issuer, not by the investors. The investor trades in the secondary market. The investor trades units that already exist. So all of those additional costs is actually sitting outside the fund and not affect the NAV. So I can see lots of skeptical faces. I can see these people that say, mm -mm, no man, you're having this on. So let's look at some evidence. So the best way that I can look at this evidence is to answer the question that says, why does an index tracking unit trust underperform an ETF from the same issuer that tracks the same index? So what I'm doing here is I'm keeping as many of my variables constant. It's the same index, it's the same issuer, so it's the same team, the same processes, same everything. The only thing that different, differs is the ETF compared to the unit trust. So let's have a look, and I'm not picking on Satrix. I love Satrix. <laughs> Satrix, in fact, has got such a wonderful range of products that it makes it very easy to use it as an example, because they've got ETFs and index funds, index unit trusts that track exactly the same indices. So over the most recent three-year period, the Satrix 40, top 40 ETF, gave a return of 7.29% per annum. The Satrix 40 index fund, exactly the same period, the same index, same everything, 6.85% per annum. Underperformed by 0.44% per annum. Let's look at another example. Let's look at the RAFI 40. Total return of the ETF, 11.19%. Total return of the index fund, the unit trust, 10.63%. 0.56% per annum underperformance. Let's look at the Divi Plus. Divi Plus over that three-year period, 13.24% per annum for the ETF, 12.75% for the index fund, 0.49% per annum underperformance. <laughs> Why? Why? Because it is the cost of actually creating and redeeming those units. It's all about those trading costs that are associated with the investment flows. And as I say, they go into the NAV, the net asset value. And so when we look at performance, we compare the net asset value from one point in time to the net asset value at a different point in time. And lo and behold, after a while, you see how they start drifting apart. And it all depends on the frequency and the size of those cash flows and the turnover rate that you've got in the fund. Final thoughts on total expense ratio before we move on from here. You can't avoid it. <laughs> this is unfortunately not one of those costs that you can get rid of. You want the product, you've got to pay some total expense ratio costs. You can't negotiate it, especially not in a unit trust. One cost for everybody in the unit trust, and the same with the ETF. But what you can do is you can evaluate it, and you can choose lower costs. So this is where you've got a choice. But I just want to warn you, you know, don't just rush into making changes purely on the basis of lower cost. Take into consideration what it's going to cost you to switch. Take into consideration whether there might be capital gains tax implications. Don't be penny wise and pound foolish. And I'm going to show you some other costs further down the line that are much bigger than what we've looked at here. So don't rush into making a change for five basis points or 10 basis points, which next year could very well be the other way around again. So certainly look at that, but don't rush into making rash changes. Very important also is that a total expense ratio is not a cash flow expense. So what I mean with that is when you look at your investment statement, you're not going to see it as a rand and cents amount in your investment statement. You can see the total expense ratio and the TIC on the fund fact sheet, 
but it's not going to sit anywhere in your investment statement. And it's because it is not a cash flow expense that comes out of your pocket. But what it does do, so it's sitting in the price that you pay. That's already accounted for in there. And so over time, what it does is it affects your returns. So yes, it is absolutely important. The fact that you can't see it overtly in your investment statement doesn't make it important. And that's why you've got to look at low cost and consider making those changes because it does affect your return over the longer term. Cost type number two. Because now you're going to say to me, okay, that's great. I hear what you say about ETFs being cheaper than index unit trusts. But now you still got to go buy this thing on the stock exchange and you just told us about high transaction costs. So please, come on. Is it really all that fair? So look, let's look at some of these acquisition costs. The transaction costs, yes, there is not just the initial buy that you do. There's also the reinvestment of your dividends over time. Certainly, if you want to take account of compounding. There's our next uh, little TLA, DWT, dividend withholding tax. There's also the cost involved if you want to sell or switch or do any form of trading in terms of exchange traded products. So what are the components of your acquisition costs? Well, we started to look at them already when we looked at the cost of actually investing the underlying in those unit trusts. So we've got our trading costs, the brokerage, the statutory charges and so on. But we also have got a bid offer spread to deal with. And we're going to look at that in a, in a bit more detail in a bit. But there's also the potential capital gains tax, another three-letter acronym, CGT, that we've got there. Now, an interesting one, just as an aside, taxes are not negotiable. We know that. But did you know that capital gains tax is actually always a lower rate than dividend withholding tax? Dividend withholding tax, we're just paying away because we don't even see the money. Only 80% of the dividend that is paid by the issuer ends up in your account. But actually, the maximum that you can pay for capital gains tax is 18%. So we should be not so concerned about not wanting to pay capital gains tax. Sometimes it can be the much lower cost of tax. But that just as an aside. Let's move on in terms of the cost of managing your own share portfolio. Because what I often find is when I share with people the simplicity of ETFs, and especially very transparent and well understood indices such as the top 40 index, I often get people that then say, oh, why should I pay an ETF provider all that product costs that you were talking about and putting it all together? I'm just going to do it myself. So let's look at what does it cost to do it yourself, because I'm sure that many of you sitting here do have share portfolios as well. So what does it cost you to buy the 40 individual company shares that make up the top 40 index? And let's compare that to the cost of buying the one ETF that gives you exactly the same 40 companies. So let's go back to our illustration in terms of our different costs that we've got. And let's say I've got 100,000 Rand that I want to invest. My brokerage, so that's a fairly common rate on some of your online um, share trading platforms, five, um, half a percent plus VAT. And my JC fees and levies as before, 443, STT. At 2.25%, remember, you pay it, pay, it, pay it only on the buy leg. And now my net investment amount actually means that my investment cost me 1.3%. And how often do we think that my investment only cost me 0.5% because that's my brokerage rate? And actually, your total cost is significantly more, and it is because of your STT plus the JSE fees and levies. Now, if I take that exact same 100,000 Rand and I go and invest it in a top 40 ETF, I still pay the same brokerage if I'm on the same platform, but now I'm just doing a single transaction. Suddenly, that JSE levy, so I'm just buying one package deal here. And, whoops, no STT. What happened there? Well, I'm not buying a security, security transfer tax. I'm buying a unit in a unit trust. So there's no STT payable. The STT was paid inside the ETF when those shares were bought. So suddenly at this one, my total cost of my investment at 0.6% is a lot closer to my 0.5%, which is my brokerage. Very little extra that comes into it. I'm not even talking about having to make the changes as time goes on in terms of the 40 shares that make up the top 40 portfolio and the costs associated with that. This is just the initial once-off buy that I'm looking at. But you know what? This is the good news. What I do just want to also share with you is, whoops, one too far. 
So obviously, in, in a model like this, where you're trading ETFs, your brokerage rate that you're paying starts becoming incredibly important because that's virtually the total cost that you would be paying. So look around for different brokerage costs. So ETFSA, for example, 0.08% plus VAT, that means you're paying less than one rand per thousand rand that you're investing. Also, look at the way in which the statutory charges are paid. If you are dealing with an individual online share trading account or a stockbroking portfolio, you are paying those statutory charges yourself for every single trade that you make. If you do it via a platform that actually has got the license to bulk. Bulking basically means that those statutory charges are shared amongst all the investors on the day. So the proportion that you would be paying of that 11 rand becomes minuscule, and that becomes extremely important when you look at the reinvestment of your dividends in particular. But that is an aside. So you might look at these sort of percentages and say, sure, that's not lacquer. But this is the good news, actually, because how many people have got 100,000 rand at a time to invest? What does this look like if you don't have the 100,000 rand to invest? What if you only have, say, 10,000 rand to invest? Or 5,000 rand? If you've only got 5,000 rand, it's going to cost you more than 10% to buy the 40 shares. And in fact, actually, you can't buy them because you won't be able to buy Nuspers plus the other 39 with your 5,000 rand. And I'm afraid that if you've got 500 rand to invest, you can't even afford the fees and the charges. So how do we democratize investments? How do we bring more people into the investment world unless we actually provide them with models that significantly reduces the acquisition cost, the transaction cost of buying and selling on the stock exchange? And that's really where ETFs have had an incredible role to play um, over the last 20 years. So there are different cost models when it comes to acquisition. Let's just look at some of the examples. So you might have something that is, a, for example, an investment platform, ETFSA. There's the, um, this is all, by the way, including um, VAT. Easy Equities, 25 basis points plus VAT. Standard Bank, OST. There's another TLA, online share trading. Um, and they are 50 basis points plus VAT, subject to MFC. What's MFC? Hmm. It's just a minimum fixed cost. I was just fooling with you. So minimum fixed cost. They do have a minimum fixed cost of 110 Rand per trade. So if you're doing a relatively small trade, you're going to be paying the 110 Rand, not the 0.5%. So beware of some of these sort of you know, models that are mixed in terms of percentages and fixed cost. Because there's the minimum trade that you've got there. It is negotiable if you trade more than half a million Rand. Right, I'm still working up to that. Um, then, of course, there's, that's not all. Um, there's a withdrawal fee. If you want to take money to your bank account, there's money to be paid. If you want to transfer your portfolio somewhere else, there's another cost that you've got to pay per shareholding. And that TLA ETC stands for et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because those are the costs on the Standard Bank online share trading account. I am not knocking Standard Bank online share trading, not at all. In fact, they are one of the better online share trading platforms that are there. But you can see with that complexity in terms of a cost structure for a stockbroking account, can you see why we are quickly sort of disappearing down with Alice down the rabbit hole? If I can get the button to work, then I might be able to go with Alice. There we go, down the rabbit hole. And you know what was my favorite part of all of this? Hidden in there, it says, there are no other charges applicable for trading. <laughs> I should bloody well hope not. <laughs> I thought there was already enough as it was. So what I'm trying to highlight to you here is that you need to understand the complexity of the particular platform or model that you're working with. And that's why I advocate that you do a PPF model. So do you know what that one means? A PPF model really is a personalized pro forma model. This is for you to calculate for your own type and style and amount of investing that you do. How much does it actually cost you to invest and use different platforms and different cost models? Because it's not about being good or bad or right or wrong. Different models suit different styles of trading and investing. So to do such a model, what you really need to ask yourself is, well, what are you investing? 500 Rand? 50,000 Rand? 5 million Rand? What are you buying? Are you buying five ETFs or 50 shares? 
Am I compounding my interest? Am I reinvesting my dividends? How much does it cost me to do that? Um, you know, what other sort of con considerations are there in terms of it? Am I a trader or am I an investor? Totally different models in terms of costs. And I think very importantly, do you have itchy fingers? Or are you quite patient with your investments? Because I can tell you if you've got itchy fingers or if you're a nervous Nora, and every time something, someone opens their mouth on TV and you rush to go and sell your shares, best you get a very low cost model or else you are going to um, not need any of the trouble that we've got in the country. You will be sorting yourself out into poverty. <laughs> That's a surefire way. So the important thing is for you to compare different models based on your behavior, how often you trade, what you do, et cetera, et cetera. So as I say, there's no one good or one bad model in terms of the acquisition costs, make sure that you get something that's fit for purpose for you. But then there's those indirect costs also that I mentioned, and the indirect cost is really our bid offer spread. This is another of those costs that we're never going to see on our statements or even on a fact sheet or anything. The bid offer spread is also known as the double, and that's the difference between the buying and the selling price, and that's really how the market maker makes his money or her money, the fee. And um, really, it sits at the mid of the BBO, which is at the NAV. The best bid offer is at the net asset value, okay? <laughs> so that gives you, uh, helps you also intraday as an indicative nav to get an idea of where is the market, what is the current live value, the net asset value of the ETF that you're trading with. Of course, we don't have that with shares, but that's a story for another day. But now also be aware of cents in terms of the double, and percentage. Which of these three spreads are the biggest? And which is the smallest? Maybe I should say that. <laughs> so actually this one, this one rand spread is the smallest to the, the narrowest. It's 1.7%. And this 200 rand spread that I've got there, sorry, 2,000 rand spread is 5%. So be careful also when you look at a relatively sh small price, sometimes a one cent or a two cent or a three cent double can be a one percent or a two percent double. So make sure that you look at that size of the double and not get caught. And I think one of the biggest problems here is that this is a dangerous area for people that do blind trading. So who's the three blind mice of blind trading? The first one is the automated trading models. The things that just hit the bids and offers that are on the screen because I've got some algorithmic trade or some automated trading system or whatever. It's not a good idea to do that with ETFs in South Africa yet. I hope we'll get there one day, but we're definitely not there yet. Second blind mice, stale orders. People that put in bids or offers and leave them and forget them and then they get hit when they least expect it. And then the third one also is just going on screen seeing the prices that are up there and just trading and not knowing what is actually the underlying net asset value. So if you want to start doing your own trading in ETFs, best you watch with a very careful eye. Um, you know, this is really where it is a potential significant cost if you don't watch what you're doing. And that's why we usually recommend that you should deal with a platform or a broking account that specializes in ETFs that can actually either watch this on your behalf or certainly do those trades for you so that they're either at or much closer to that net asset value. Admin, platform costs. Now, this is probably one of the most contentious costs that are out there because it's also one of those that's the most difficult to actually put a value on. Yes, it's a cost that's out there, but most people feel that, you know what, it's not worth what I'm getting for it. And again, you've got different types of models. It might be a percentage-based model or it could be a fixed-case um, model, you know, 60 Rand per month for your account or it is um, – 20, you know, 0.2% of your, of the portfolio size or whatever. Just know that if you are on a percentage based model and you're a relatively large investor, you are effectively subsidizing the smaller investors. If you are in a fixed cost model, best you don't do that if you've got small investments because it's going to be a very big proportion of your overall cost base. So watch what the model is versus the amount of money that you have and make sure that you choose wisely. Beware certain requirements, things like no monthly or annual fees if you maintain a minimum balance or you trade often enough. 
You know, these sort of terms and conditions, T's and C's, that's almost another TLA. Those sort of things are things that I think catch us into this almost vortex of having to do certain things when it's not necessarily appropriate for you to be trading. But also ask yourself, what else do I get on that platform of mine? Do they maybe give me research, price feeds, analytics, information, education? What do I get for this platform service that I've got there? Um, what else? Do they offer automation? For example, can I run a debit order for my regular monthly investments? Do they automatically reinvest my dividends for me, or do I have to manually go and remember and think to do so? Um, what else? You know, do they give me maybe a, a, a better execution, maybe better trading than I would get if I was going for a DIY model? So look at what else the platform gives you and then ask yourself, what is it that you need? And is this maybe better or worse for you than the next platform that might be there? Be aware, beware of zero fee offerings. The fact of the matter is there is no such thing as a zero cost model for the provider. The costs are there. We can't get away from them. So if you're being offered it at a zero fee, ask yourself, where else are they making money out of me? Are they selling me other stuff that I didn't really want or need? Or are they hiding it somewhere else? Or is this just a loss leader to get me into a different part of the platform or whatever the case might be? I think one of the very interesting ones is the latest, the fidelity fee. That's now everybody's all the rage, zero fee ETFs. It's for a very select number of ETFs, and it's only for existing clients, and it's only, and the stated intention is, it is to actually sell higher cost and higher value product to you somewhere else on their platform. So be very careful. I would much rather pay a fair fee and know that I've got value for what I'm paying than this obsession with zero, 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 and then we actually end up, we're in an environment where we want safety and security. Surely we want to have some sort of comfort that we're paying a fair price for what it is that we need from it. Because ultimately, you know, those regulatory charges are unavoidable. And that's the safeguarding of your assets and information, amongst other things. Reporting, which you also need, and regulatory reporting. The systems, the people, the marketing, the overreach, all of those sort of things is complicated. So be careful with this obsession that you ne never want to pay anything. In Afrikaans, we say, goed koop, koop is dier koop. So what is fair then? Determine what is valuable to you. For example, do you prefer personal client service or do you prefer high tech? What's valuable to you? Don't be naive. Please don't think if that they say that it's zero, that it is zero, because it's not. <laughs> so don't be naive. And then calculate what you are paying in rands, because I think sometimes one can appreciate better what my cost structure is if I look at it in rands rather than as a percentage. Calculate it in rands and then decide. Is this fair? Do I feel that I'm getting value for money in terms of what I'm doing? The last one then is advice costs. Now, advice costs, I think, is the one that we do know is entirely avoidable, negotiable, and not necessary. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be paying an advisor. Again, an advisor can either charge an AUM, another TLA, assets under management fee, or a flat fee. It could be included in your platform fee, but make sure that the platform actually has the necessary licenses to give you advice. They can't give you advice. They can give you factual information, but not advice if they are not licensed to do so. Again, also, make sure that the type of advice that you're getting is fit for purpose. So, for example, do they specialize in what you need? Do you need investments from that platform? Do you need insurance? Are you looking for a financial planner? Do you need a personal trainer, somebody that's actually going to help you stay the course? If that's what you need, then that's a really, really important reason to have a financial planner. And God forbid that you're in this last category where effectively um, you are exposed to a commission-earning, blood-sucking leech that you've never even met. Yes, there, I said it. <laughs> Because unfortunately, there are many people who have been tied into long-term products that were sold to them by some advisor many, many years ago, who just handed over that book to the next advisor, who now earns a blood-sucking commission-earning leech every month, every year from you, and you haven't even met the person. So financial advice is incredibly valuable. Make sure that you get what you want to need, and make sure that you don't pay someone who you've never met. Warren Buffett said, investments should be bought, not sold. 
I'm just going to leave it at that. So what else? That's our fifth category. What else is still out there? Remember I said I would speak about performance costs. And my big bugbear with performance fees is that you are paying for performance that someone else got. Because performance fees by their very nature is backward looking. So it's about past performance that future fees are based on. So here's a tip to avoid the double whammy. The first thing that people do when they invest in the good past performer, not only are they buying at the worst time at the top, but they are most likely now going to be starting to pay higher fees for performance that they didn't get. So you are much better off after a period of good performance to sell out of a fund before they introduce the performance fees and then you can buy that other one that's right nice at the bottom. So performance fees, there's no reason to pay a performance fee. If you've got a performance fee in any investment that you've got, get out of it. I promise you, even the capital gains tax that you might have to pay, you're still better off than having to pay a performance fee. The next one is the issue of debit order costs. You know, I smile sometimes at how obsessed we can become with a five basis point fee on a TER, for example. If you've got a 300, man, 300 rand per month debit order running and you're charged a three rand debit order fee, do you realize that you're paying 1% per month just for your debit order? On a simple compounding, that's 12% <laughs> you haven't even invested. Do a monthly recurring investment from your internet banking account. It costs you nothing. You're in control. You can stop it whenever you want to. You can increase it. You can change it. Be careful of debit order costs. Tax. Is tax a cost or not? It's certainly unavoidable, but it can be mitigated. So make use of your tax incentives before you move into discretionary investments. I know it's very exciting to have a share trading account or a stockbroking portfolio, but if you haven't made maximum use of the tax-free investment allowance and the retirement annuity savings allowances that you've got, you're really sort of leaving money on the table. Um, so really make sure that you make as much use of that to avoid it becoming a cost Two quick final slides on the idea of the all-in cost model. So I'm going to share with you two models as we do it, a 1% all-inclusive model, because I want to explain to you how it works, but also give you a sense of the rands and cents that we're talking about. So, for example, on a tax-free investment account, a 1% all-inclusive fee means that if you invest your full annual allowance of 33,000 rand, you're paying the total cost of 330 rand a year. That includes that 43 Rand. If you were going to do this investment yourself, based on our models that we had before, it would cost you 137 Rand. The FSP, our sales, which are able to do it at better prices, only 62 Rand. The reinvestment of your distributions. Do you see the initial cost versus the reinvestment of your distributions? Why? Because of those transaction costs, those JC fees and levies and straight charges that you pay. If you're in a model where you've got to pay each of those costs yourself, the total cost for you is more, almost three times as much as what it would cost you in a 1% all-in charge. So in terms of what uh, we would be getting out of that, well, the total cost we share with the administrator. So it means the fee earned by the administrator is 78 Rand a year, and uh, we also get 78 Rand a year. That's 6 Rand 50 per month. So can I have another water here at the JC, please? Let's look at a managed account portfolio. So sort of the alternative to maybe a share portfolio or a stockbroking portfolio or an investments in unit trust. So, a 1 million rand portfolio on a 1% all-inclusive fee means 10,000 rand a year that it's going to cost you. Includes the VAT, 1,304 rand. Transaction costs, if you were going to invest the million rand yourself, and in my example, I'm using five ETFs, 4% dividend yields paid quarterly, a monthly account fee. There's your DIY transaction costs, your reinvestment of your distributions, an admin fee, and you end up with a cost of the DIY that's more than that. And now you've had to do it all yourself. You don't get the advice, you don't get the managing of the account, the watching of what's happening, um, and anything else that goes with it. Whereas if you use the all-in cost model, no, I don't get 10,000 Rand a year from that. The fee that is earned by the FSP is 5,562 Rand per annum, 463 Rand and 50 cents per annum. 
And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I drive a 13-year-old VW. <laughs> right. Last slide. A glossary of some other TLAs. And these specifically relate to retirement savings, to the insurance-based products and so on, because you might very well have that in your overall portfolio as well. So you might have seen more of this cost called an EAC that is being missed, um, uh, used in retirement savings products, effective annual costs. Great move forward in terms of transparency. It discloses the cost for you in four different layers, investment management fee, advice fee, administration, and then that wonderful catch-all bucket, bucket called other costs. <laughs> but at least you get an idea of the total cost of your retirement product. Another one that they've just announced that most of you probably never will see, but it's the REC, which is the, reti the Retirement Savings Cost Disclosure Standard. And this is some something similar to the EAC, but it's really designed for um, trustees or for um, the, the principal office and so on wanting to compare the cost structures of umbrella funds. So you can see wonderful progress that is being made in our industry, not just in terms of transparency, but in terms of fair comparisons as well. Another one, uh, the old one that we used in the insurance industry, an RIY, the reduction in yield, um, that really just sort of said to you, based on all the costs that you had, how much did you lose in terms of the yield that you should have received that was paid away to cost? And finally, the IRR, the internal rate of return, a great way to give you an idea of based on your rhythm of when you invested how much money over a longer period of time, what was the return that you received, which will be different than the return that you will see on the fund fact sheet, because the fund fact sheet assumes a lump sum investment on the first day and just held thereafter, whereas for most of us, we are investing over time, cash flows in and so on. So the IRR will be your personal rate of return. And really that brings me to my concluding thoughts. Um, I think very important for me in terms of conclusion is that I'd love to get the clicker to work. <laughs> know your costs. It matters, it really matters a lot. And we now have sufficient transparency and disclosure that there's no excuse for you not to know anymore what you are paying for your costs. Um, understand what of those costs are unavoidable, what of it is negotiable and what is unnecessary. And make sure that you pay um, where payment is due. But you know what, focus your efforts on where you wanna be mad. I know after you've seen all of these costs, you're feeling quite mad, but you know what, Look at where you can make a difference. Because some of these things are outside of your control, so focus on the things that you can control. So like not paying 1% per month debit order fees, for example. So, and don't be naive about claims of no fees or zero costs. You are really just naive if you actually think you're not paying anything anywhere. And if you're still not sure what to do, well, you know what? Then you need to talk to the investment or investment with the ETF specialists. So, don't be a cheapskate, please, especially not with your investments. It's too valuable, but I'm also certainly not standing here and saying to you, shut up and take my money, but if you want to, you know, it's fine. But no, what I'm really saying to you here is pay what is fair and make sure that you get fair for good value. So, pay a fair price for quality because investments are important and your money is extremely important. So, make sure that you pay what is fair. Question time.